Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Board of Commissioners, City of Bowling Green, Kentucky, regular meeting, City Hall, February 7th, 2023 at 4.30. Uh, we're gonna begin with our invocation and pledge allegiance, and I'll turn it over to Commissioner Carlos Bailey. Uh, today, I'm honored to have uh, Pastor uh, Lee Fishback. He's also been the pastor of uh, Mount Hermon Baptist Church in Adairville, and he served as the pastor for 20 years. He is also a moderator of the Union District Association of Baptist Churches, which consists of 36 <coughs> churches, I believe. You've been married for the last 24 years, and you have four surviving children as well. So today, I would, I'm honored just to ask you to come give the invocation. Thank you, Commissioner. We're happy and honored to be here. <laughs> and certainly, we can't do anything without prayer, so let us pray. Father, we come thanking you for this, this day. Thank you for sparing us this another day, dear Lord, that you have granted us life, a reasonable portion of health and strength. We thank you for allowing us to come to this appointed place today, amen, for the purpose of uh, the city's business. And we realize, Lord, that all business is your business. It should be your business because we can't do anything without you. We ask our blessings upon each and every heart that's gathered here today, every home that's represented. Sir, that we want to remember the commissioners, Lord, that are serving uh, from the bottom of their hearts to grant this city uh, the benefits and blessings that it stands in need of. We thank you, Lord. Help us to uh, be minded of others that are, that are in need. Certainly we are. Uh, our hearts are heavy for the lives that were lost in the tornado and Syria and certainly those that are uh, unfortunate all over this land. But we give you glory and we give you praise knowing that uh, in your word you said as long as we lean and depend and put our faith in you that everything certainly would be all right. So we praise you today and we come in the name of Jesus and in his holy name, we call out to you, amen. amen. I would ask everybody to turn to the flag as we do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend Fishback. Thank you, Commissioner Carlos Bailey. Mr. Mrs. Hope, would you please do our roll call, please? Commissioner Perigen, absent. Commissioner Bailey? Here. Commissioner Beasley Brown? Here. Commissioner Hill? Here. Mayor Alcott? Here. Mr. Meisel, do you have any comments at this time? The only one, Mayor, is uh, the standard is if you're in the audience and you wish to make public comments at the end of the regular session, please sign the, the uh, sheet in the back of the room and we'll, we'll handle those at the end of the regular session. Thank you, Mr. Meisel. Okay, our first item of consideration is our regular meeting, January 17th, 2023, special work session and goal planning meeting from January 19th in 2023. So our minutes so and then and moved by Commissioner Carlos Bailey, second by Commissioner Hill. Any discussion? None. Roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal order number 2023-18. Municipal order approving the career path advancement of Timmy Cowles and David Webb to the position of operations technician two in the public works department. So move. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Beasley Brown. Mr. Meisel. Mayor, I'd like to ask uh, David Delp, our public works operations division manager, to come up and make his recommendations uh, for promotions to operation maintenance tech twos. We've got uh, two for you tonight, David. Thank you. Um, just so everybody knows the operations uh, divisions on uh, of course we take care of public streets and everything um, to advance in operations we have an OMT manual and in that you have different classes uh, to do that there's different tasks in each OMT one two and three that you must you know accomplish and then sign off either by a supervisor or a crew leader to say that you have you know accomplished that task and that you can do it it can be from 
starting out from mowing to bush hog to you know later on our bigger uh, trucks, snow plows and everything. Um, so I'd like to, of course, you know, recommend uh, David Webb and Tim Cowles have completed their OMT-1 and what we call mandatory and OMT-2 to be able to, to move up. Um, David Webb, uh, he can't be here tonight, but uh, he joined operations in uh, June of 2021. Um, so he's been here for about a year and I think eight months it was. He's currently on what we call our concrete division or concrete crew and works with our, works with those guys there doing our sidewalks, drainage. And David has become, you know, a good asset um, in doing that for us and is taken, you know, um, to heart, you know, to do that work and everything. So appreciate really what he's done and everything for us. The other person is uh, Tim Cowles, which happens to be here tonight. Um, Tim is also, he's been here since October of 2021 um, to move up. He has also been on kind of our drainage side. I mean, and with both these, th these guys have done other tasks and everything like that too, but then we kind of put guys settle in where we think they can help us out. Um, Tim has um, done, I think, an, an excellent job. He's now kind of leading our vector and drains and keeping them clean and everything like that. Um, and I've been really happy with what, you know, Tim's done for us in, in doing that and taking hold of it, going out, trying to make sure our drains are clean, trying to stay up ahead of it, you know, before we get rains and everything like that um, to minimize, you know, what we can do and stuff like that. So um, I'd just like to say, you know, for both of them that I'm glad to have both of them working here for operations. Thank you, Mr. Delt. And uh, thank you for being here, Timothy. Uh, commissioners, any questions? All right. Roll call, please. Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Congratulations, Timothy and David, on your new career path. Appreciate you. <laughs> Municipal Order Number 2023 19. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointment of Adam Brown to the position of police officer in the police department. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Bailey, Mr. Meisel. We have an opportunity uh, before us tonight for a, a lateral transfer, as we call it, and I'd like to uh, bring up Aaron Holsey, our HR director, to introduce uh, Mr. Brown to you and uh, make a recommendation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, we are recommending Adam Brown as a certified police officer to join the Bowling Green Police Department. Um, Adam is currently a police officer with Paducah. He also serves in the Army National Guard. He was first certified with the Russellville Police Department. So when he um, joins the BGPD, he will not have to go through our 23-week academy, um, but he will go through some initial training um, just to be initiated into our policies and, and our city. Um, as you know, we take applications for certified police officers year round, and so we're really excited for Adam to join our department. He's with us tonight. If you could please stand and let me know if you have any questions. Hello, Mr. Brown. We uh, appreciate you being here tonight. Um, I know this is a sad day for Russellville, but it's a great day for Bowling Green. So, um, Paducah, I'm, I'm sorry, Paducah. Our, Sad day for Paducah, a great day for Bowling Green. So, Adam, do you have family? I know you're not here tonight, but do you have family? Yes. I have two children. All right. Well, we um, welcome you to Bowling Green. And um, I know, commissioners, this is our fourth lateral that we've had. And I commend our HR department. I commend the police department um, from the meetings they had with the commissioners a little less than a year ago on trying to recruit, retain, and to ensure that our police force is uh, getting back up to par. And we're still working on that, and I appreciate that initiation of what's going on um, with both of y'all. So thank y'all. Commissioners? All right. Roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Congratulations. Municipal Order Number 2023-20. 20. 
Municipal order authorizing and accepting bid number 2023-34 for transportation services from Hope House Ministries of Bowling Green, Kentucky in an amount not to exceed $150,000. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Beasley Brown, second by Commissioner Hill, Mr. Meisel. So uh, we have received some additional CARES money and uh, this is in year 17. Uh, we did an amendment to that action plan uh, recently and approved the HUD to be utilized for, the, for this award here. Uh, these are, uh, this item here is for transportation services to, uh, for employment centers. This is a need we've seen for a while to get people to, to, to work uh, that do, do not have transportation. We solicited bids and we got two bids here uh, before you tonight, Hope House Ministries and Uber. Uh, after evaluating these bids, uh, we have uh, chosen to recommend Hope House Ministries uh, for this service and provide, give them an award of $150,000 to provide this service. Uh, Brent and Nick uh, have worked on this and are here, can answer any questions you might have on this, but this is an exciting, uh, exciting activity that we're getting ready to, to take on and provide transportation to uh, people that need it for, for to, get, to go to work, to get to their, their jobs. All right, so do we know if it's gonna also go out to the Transpark or is it anywhere? I believe this is uh, gonna go to Transpark and the South Industrial Park and, and uh, maybe a few other places, Brent. That's correct, it is focused on the Transpark in the South Industrial Park. Those two are both outside of the transit service area. Uh, almost everything else is within the transit service area. Uh, those two are the far exceptions on the north end and on the southern end. How long will this last? Is this gonna be- Two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. One follow-up question. Uh, will this just reimburse them for their current ride to work van they have, or will this allow them to expand to offer all more? All of this is expansion. Okay, great. Uh, still be all three shifts. Uh, but it will also be looking at additional pickup locations and the goal of this is to expand what they're already doing and help support the, some of the efforts that they already have. That is great. So if somebody wanted to utilize this service, when do we think it'll be ready to kind of launch? It'll probably be a couple months uh, before they're ready to get everything going, but they can still go ahead and reach out to Hope House as part of their existing services. Really what we got to build on our side is the data collection side uh, of everything uh, for the funding part but they, they can call Hope House right now and get uh, support to, to get to work. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brett. I visited the Hope House and their vans, you know, operation now, um, what they're doing is incredible. Um, they have found the niche that has been able to find where workforce is needed. And um, I will state that a lot of people accomplishing the jobs are needing reintegration into the job force. And so I think it's been beneficial for us um, multiple uh, platitudes. So I'm excited about this. Okay, roll call please. Troubles. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal order number 2023-21. Municipal order authorizing the submission of a grant application to the U.S. Department of Homeland, Se Homeland Security through the Federal Emergency Management Agency Assistance to Firefighters Grant Program in an amount up to $110,974.55 for equipment for the fire department. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Beasley Brown, second by Commissioner Bailey. Mr. Meisel. Through the, uh, through the feds uh, program this assistance to firefighters grant uh, ap applications. We've done several of these and these are very, very good grants. This is a 90-10 grant. Uh, we only have to match 10%, which is really, really good. But we are wanting to uh, purchase 26 sets of turnout gear with this money. Uh, if we were to get it, uh, this is to apply for it. And uh, this would supply our 15 new firefighters up at the Transpark station once it's up and running, uh, and 11 other existing firefighters. Uh, these are uh, important uh, pieces of equipment. The turnout gear is what they wear into their fires um, for protection. In addition to the 26 sets of turnout gear, we would also like to use this money to buy four sets of the uh, air packs, the self-contained breathing apparatuses, uh, they come with a face mask and uh, the air packs and the two air cylinders as well. Uh, 
so we ask for your support uh, for applying for this grant um, with the assistance to firefighters grant program. Uh, Nick Cook is here, can answer any questions, along with Acting Chief uh, Rob Gillum, uh, also in the room tonight with us. Watching the train wreck and seeing the materials and the hazardous materials come through, this is phenomenal that we have this type of protection for our first responders. So, excellent work. Okay, roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Ordinance number BG 2023 2, first reading, non binding. Ordinance amending zoning, zoning ordinance. Ordinance amending articles 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and Appendix A of the zoning ordinance for the city of Bowling Green, Kentucky, as recommended by the City County Planning Commission. So move. Second. Move back Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Beasley Brown. Mr. Meisel. This was an item in our uh, January 19th uh, all day working session. Uh, uh, we went we went over these changes in your packets uh, is the summary of, of the changes for for each article in, included and uh, Ben Peterson with Planning Commission is here tonight can answer any further questions you might have on these uh, amendments okay, thank you mr. Meisel commissioners by all incorporated cities within Warren County and uh, we would we'd be the first out of the box uh, to, to approve these and can you explain i guess to the citizens how this improves you know just the life and the changes that we're going to make the improvements that's going to be caused because of the amendments sure um so there's uh there's a number of changes the zoning ordinance is about 250 300 pages and we're making changes to about 80 85 or 87 of those uh so i'm not gonna go over every one of those unless you really need me to no, you i'll just to. highlight just a uh, summary yeah i'll just highlight uh the the five uh, biggest changes the first was uh signs the temporary signs uh, we, uh, a couple of years ago, made a change where we don't allow any of those temporary signs in the right-of-way anymore. Uh, we will uh, be, uh, if uh, upon approval, making a change to allow uh, commercial temporary signs to be off-premise. Uh, so if you want to put up a sign, you would be able to negotiate with a, a commercially zoned property uh, owner to, uh, to then put up a temporary sign. So realtors, auctioneers, uh, and really any other business would be able to, to uh, then now place a sign at another business location within the community. Uh, and next, uh, then and I'll kind of combine two of them here uh, in our historic districts. Uh, related to signage, uh, we'll, we'll provide the option for digital uh, and lighted signs in historic districts wouldn't be allowed by right they would still have to go to the historic board for approval uh, and then also we are updating our historic overlay standards so the the uh, policies and and uh, 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 standards that govern all of our uh, local historic districts uh, we have rewritten those to make them um, hopefully easier to understand easy to follow easier for people who live in those districts or own property in those districts to know what could be approved um, based on what they want to do. It's just rewritten to hopefully be uh, easily understandable. Um, the next uh, thing I'll highlight is our harvest host RVs or RV locations. So at major tourist attractions and uh, wineries, those types of things. Um, what I call our brown sign location. So if you see a brown sign on the, on the interstate, uh, they, uh, those locations would have the option to have an RV stay overnight, just one night uh, by right. Uh, for wineries, for example, it'd be just one spot and one night, uh, some uh, by right. Uh, other locations would be up to four by right for one night. So the rail park, the Corvette Museum, those types of things. So that should help help in the, the tourism realm. And that was a request uh, generated by, uh, by a group of uh, tourism folks. Uh, the next uh, would be uh, some add some fle flexibility within areas encompassed by the floodplain. So essentially, if we're going to have a larger commercial 
project, uh, which we hope we do, are moving towards here. And Bowling Green, a private developer uh, that has over five acres, would be allowed some flexibility within the fl floodplain to have some uh, recreational activities to uh, help support that redevelopment. It would not be uh, just allowing anything and everything in the floodplain. There still be uh, still be heavily regulated and would have all the all the proper approvals needed. It'd just be allowed to have some flexibility in order to have some riverfront redevelopment. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is uh, not the, the probably, it's probably the least palatable of the changes in, uh, in, in some regards, but that would be in relation to group living facilities, uh, people who are protected by the Federal Fair Housing, dis, as disabled under the Fair, Federal Fair Housing Act, uh, group homes, group living, there's lots of different terms but essentially uh, we are needing to change our ordinance to allow those to be uh, anywhere by right. And uh, we have some regulations put in place to uh, restrict uh, the number of people that can go in those uh, locations. It'd be up to eight people, be bedroom based, uh, two people per bedroom, but a maximum of eight people. But essentially, those would be allowed to to go anywhere in the community now. So, um, that's without getting too deep into the to the weeds. There, that's essentially the the summary of the of the major changes. Most everything else is just kind of housekeeping and language changes. Appreciate you, Mr. Yep. If you don't mind, will you state once again on that last one that real we as a city do yeah. not have a choice in this? Right, uh, so locally we are very uh, restricted as uh, the case law has matured over the really four, four decades uh, on these group homes, uh, including several Supreme Court rulings, U.S. Supreme Court rulings that uh, we feel like the ordinance that we're uh, suggesting here pretty much is it, and to, to, for lack of a better term, we don't have a whole lot of choice in the matter, and, and so it's kind of it is what it is and we're regulating them as much as possible Hillary there is one um, possibility I found out this week that our state legislature is looking at possibly passing maybe this term maybe not but some sort of regulation that would regulate the people that run the group homes and so as long as it is a good you know person that is credible that is supervising these homes then it, it doesn't really matter where they are it's the pop-ups you know that you don't really know no oversight really. right with no oversight so that is a possibility it's something they're working on thank you mr peterson uh commissioners i know these are some things are palatable some things these are um, things that we have no choice on um, but there is a greater good here and i know that the government is working i mean this was not done in vain, this was done by appointees that have been working with planning and zoning for the county, the city, the small cities. Everyone has come together. They have brought this um, through a lot of talk and communication. So I appreciate the work that has gone on, on behalf of you and your team, Mr. Peterson, and uh, thank you for your hard work. Okay, commissioners, all right, roll call please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal Order Number 2023-22. Municipal Order Approving Payment in Lieu of Taxes Agreement among the City of Bowling Green, the County of Warren, the Board of Education of Warren County, and Envision AESC Bowling Green LLC related to the construction and installation of industrial facility in the City of Bowling Green. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Carlos Bailey. Mr. Meisel. So uh, hopefully some of you all have heard about this project called Envision, and it's like, $2 billion, it's 2,000 jobs. Uh, well, they are uh, working hard and they're getting ready to do what we call an industrial revenue bond. As most big projects come in, they, they need help with financing and so we issue these, the county will issue industrial revenue bonds. The company will pay the debt service on those bonds, but with those bonds uh, that takes them off the tax roll, property tax roll. 
but we have this uh, instrument called a payment in lieu of tax agreement where most companies agree to go ahead and pay uh, some portion of property taxes and make the school systems whole. So in this agreement before you tonight uh, is pretty much a standard agreement. It gives uh, Warren County Schools 100% still of the property tax uh, that they would normally get. Uh, the city and county is agreeing to give, though, uh, an abatement of the first five years of property tax in this agreement. But starting in year uh, six through ten, uh, we would get 25% uh, of the property tax value of this this project. And then from years uh, after years 10, 10 through 30. Uh, we would get 50%, and this is a 30-year industrial revenue bond. Once the 30 years is over and those bonds are paid off, this goes back right on the tax roll as, as a normal uh, property and would be assessed uh, as usual uh, based on market value. Uh, Meredith Rosansky is here uh, representing the ITA and the Chamber and can answer any questions you might have on this agreement, but it's a Pretty standard agreement. Uh, page four of the agreement uh, lays out the, uh, the percentages again, 100% all the way through for the for the Warren County Schools. Uh, year one through five is uh, would be tax break from the city and county. Starting in year six is when uh, the city and the county would get the 25, and then year year 11 we would get half. But Meredith is here, can answer any of your questions on this. That's your half until the 30 year termination. That's right. Municipal bond. Okay. Thank you. Meredith, I don't have any questions. I'm just excited that we're bringing 2,000 jobs in the $2 billion industry here. These are jobs that, when I was a kid in 1981, they had, you know, the Corvette plant that was here. So the chamber, Ron, and everybody that has something to do with it, that's going to be a great thing for our, our population. Because those 2,000 jobs are going to be game changers. They're going to be, you know, being able to pay a livable wage and stuff. And anybody that's looking for a job, when you guys break ground, please go out there and put your name in there to be hired. And they'll open first quarter 2025, and they'll pay OEM wages next quarter. Nice. Um, and just to follow up with that, would you mind sharing with the public uh, just kind of, you know, the partners that are working together on a plan to get our workforce uh, certified and, and the types of um, maybe either majors or degrees that to get the jobs that are coming and where people maybe could look at, at looking to make sure that they're they're potentially eligible for these jobs that's the type of thing they'd be interested in. So Envision has a similar plant in um, Smyrna, Tennessee. Um, it's a much smaller scale than what they'll be building here. They support the Nissan Leaf down there. Um, so there'll be similar positions and um, right now they're still working very closely with WKU and SkyCTC on the knowledge, skills, and abilities and certifications that they'll want because the equipment that's going in this plant doesn't exist anywhere else. And so there's some new technology that's coming that they're still uncovering what exactly they'll need. Um, but as soon as that's fleshed out, we'll provide that to you. So folks can be looking at Sky CTC and WKU uh, to kind of learn different pathways to these jobs? Uh, not yet. They're still mapping those. Right. But um, eventually. But yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Great. So Thank absolutely. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. All right, commissioners, no more questions. Roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal order number 2023-23. Municipal order approving the appointment of Michelle Gorman to the Bowling Green Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. So move. Second. Moved by Commissioner Hill, second by Commissioner Beasley Brown. Uh, this came as a recommendation from the Tourism Board, Sherry Murphy. Also came from a recommendation from our Chamber of Commerce, and uh, Michelle has agreed that she'd like to uh, serve in this capacity. And this is also uh, going to be a joint capacity appointment for the County Board and the City Board because this is a joint board. So recommend uh, Michelle Gorman for the Bowling Green uh, Area Convention Center, and to mention that Mike Simpson is stepping down from his position, and uh, he is. Uh, served well on the board, so we thank you for Mr. Simpson for his work. Okay. Roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Municipal order number 2023-24. 
Municipal order approving part participation in opioid litigation settlement settlements and authorizing the mayor to execute settlement agreements. So moved. Second. Moved by Commissioner Beasley Brown, second by Commissioner Hill. Mr. Meisel. As you all know, the uh, opioid uh, pandemic has been really, really bad, especially for the state of Kentucky. Uh, fortunately, there have been some lawsuit settlements uh, where where there are now funds that were the city is some some of the, those the city is getting. But uh, before you here is municipal order 2023-24. I'm going to hand this off to Hillary. We felt like or Hillary felt like we needed to to have a little bit more uh, particulars about what we're going to be doing, and uh, so we Hillary has written this municipal order, and I'm going to let her talk to you a little bit more about it. Hillary? Now, I actually did this one a little more general. If you'll recall, we approved participation in a settlement last year with a big th the big three manufacturers and then Johnson & Johnson. Um, since that time, there's an additional settlement out there. It's with a couple of more manufacturers. It's with some pharmacies. I think CVS, Walgreens, Walmart. It is not um, confirmed yet. They're still waiting to see who opts in to participate, but the state has opted in. And once the state opts in, then our rights are waived if we don't opt in as well. So I've drawn this very generally so that as we continue to get emails that the Commonwealth of Kentucky has opted in, the mayor has the option to opt us in as well. Um, I don't know yet how much money this is. It's a $17 billion settlement nationwide. Um, it'll be the same rubric that we are under before as far as percentages, but this is opioid money that comes to us with no work, and so it's kind of a no-brainer for us to opt in every chance we get. So rather than continuing on each settlement to come back to you, I just drew it so that we can take advantage of all the money that's out there. I was about to ask you how much money are we about to get. Well, I don't know, and it will depend on how many states opt in and yeah. whether they ultimately accept the settlement, and then they'll go back and, and apply all those percentages like last time. But but we 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 have done fairly well so far last time. So and there's, again, there, there's just multiple pools of money now that that are out there. It's, as they settle, different groups continue to settle. Um, some are in bankruptcy. They work out settlements in the bankruptcy court. You know, this it may be ongoing for several years. So. All right, Hillary. Thank you, Mr. Meisel. Any further questions? Roll call, please. Bailey? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Hill? Yes. Alcott? Yes. Mrs. Spiller, do we have any comments at this time? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call up each person. Thank you for putting your information here. Um, I'll just call your name. I'm not going to put your public information out to the public uh, but I'm trying to get my clock here uh, what we do is um, we allow up to five minutes I'll kind of give you a three four and then one um, where you are on time so that way it's fair and accessible for all Jennifer Moreland you're the first person so we'll allow you go first that money for opium is give it to Salvation Army. They are battling the drugs in this town. Salvation Army. And they should get the money. Okay. What I want to talk about, because you're doing a really good job, because um, Hope House is a really good idea. And I, I am so happy. But do you know what? Hope House missed something. Job Junction. See, if they provide transportation from Job Junction to the industrial park, that's what they should do. Hope House should be talking to Job Junction. His name is Chad. He's the director of um, Hope House. Not, uh, not Hope House, but um, Job Junction. It's supposed to be Quill Center or something like that. but. Chad, if you want to do something about transportation, Chad is the man. And if you combine Hope House and Chad, you can stop this. And see, that's what I mean. 
this town really deserves better transportation. And if the transit don't want to do it, let's find some way to do it. Okay, and um, I, this sounds really strange, and I gotta say this, okay? I'm going to school for being a medical assistant, okay? And after I get out, I wanna work at Salvation Army. And they are doing it. They are cleaning the place, and they're getting ready to put it an in intake. So they're doing it. But I'm writing a book, too. And I'm going to probably use you for aspiring for my book. So, but that's just, that's all I need to know. But if you do, if you really want to help this town, talk to Chad. Hey, I know we don't correspond but Jennifer what you provided us some information last time on the uh, transportation uh, grants for Secretary Gray and we signed those from Nick Cook he did those uh, yesterday and so that there was done in your information which you shared with us was provided to all the commissioners so thank you okay thank you Jennifer Akarika Nelson How's everybody doing tonight? We're good, thank you. I see that City Commissioner Sue Perrigan isn't present tonight, so I will address you, City Commissioner Melinda Hill. The community would like to demand for you to publicly denounce the, Re the Republican Women's Club of South Central and denounce the event that took place at Anna's Greek Restaurant on January 17th that brought Jonathan Mattingly here to discuss his book called 12 Seconds in the Dark that explained his side of the story of the murder of Breonna Taylor at Anna's Greek Restaurant. But if you will not publicly denounce this organization and restaurant, City Commissioner Melinda Hill, then the community would love to hear from you, Mayor Todd Alcott, in an official statement. You might be wondering why the community is so concerned in asking about having you publicly to denounce this organization. Well, this is because the city of Bowling Green is aware that the Republican Women's Club of South Central had publicly and financially supported and backed you and City Commissioner Sue Perrigan last year in 2022 for re-election. So this organization has promoted racism, hatred, bigotry, and extreme views here in our community. Hosting events such as this on January 17th, bringing a known killer into our community is very unwelcoming and insensitive to our community. We want to continue to unify, spread peace, love, and diversity because we are much stronger together. Brianna Taylor's life mattered, and she will always matter. Thank you. All right, thank you, Nelson. All right, the next person is Summer Shannon. Hello. Hello. My name is Summer. I am a clinician at Rivendale Behavioral Health Hospital. Um, so you all talked a little bit about the opioid epidemic and that's something I wanted to kind of speak on today. Um, one of the first things I'd like to talk about is how Narcan is not affordable or accessible to the people who need it. I understand it can be bought over the counter, but the people who, who need Narcan um, usually can't afford it and don't have access to it. Um, I'm sure you all are aware that we've had several youth in our community in Bowling Green, at Bowling Green High School, overdose and lose their life because of fentanyl. Um, we see it daily at Rivendell. Um, we have 15, 16, 17-year-olds coming in that are using fentanyl. Um, they're pressed Percocet pills, but they're, they're fake. They're fentanyl. They know they're fentanyl, and they're using them on purpose. When we talk to these kids and bring awareness about Narcan, um, most of the responses we get is, what's Narcan? Um, so the lack of education that these kids are not even aware that what Narcan is, um, is a problem in our community. We need more education about Narcan and it needs to be more accessible. In other states, there are machines where you can go freely get Narcan kits. Um, there, are, there are places, other communities, big cities, where places give out, they have buses that go around and give out free Narcan kits. Um, so I think Narcan should be more affordable, there should be more access, and there should definitely be more education about Narcan um, because the opioid epidemic is not getting any better 
and it's affecting our youth. Younger and younger now, we're seeing people die. And I'm admitting people on a daily basis that are 15 and 16 and 17 who are using fentanyl on a daily basis, and they're gonna lose their lives if something doesn't change. Um, the other thing that I feel like is important, um, the Kentucky State Police has something called the Angel Initiative, which states if someone wants to go to treatment that they will pick them up and bring them to treatment. Um, we are under the impression, unless I'm not educated in this, that the Bowling Green Police do not have this. Um, me personally, when we get calls, a lot of times we get suicide calls or we'll get calls from <clears throat> individuals who are seeking treatment. Um, uh, me personally, I've reached out to Bowling Green Police just uh, in the last few weeks. I've had to reach out uh, because I had an individual who wanted to come to treatment. He was also suicidal. Um, he was sitting outside the hospital but refused to go in. I had to keep him on the phone and have my coworker call the police. My coworker had to call the police. When the police got there, we always have the police get on the phone with us before we get off the phone and we introduce ourselves. Hi, my name is Summer, I'm with Rivendell. This individual wants to come to treatment. They're currently under the influence. They're also suicidal. They may have drugs on them. They don't have any weapons. We've already asked them this. They're not, a, they're not dangerous to you. They're just a danger to themselves. Can you please bring them in? That individual was taken to jail because he had drugs on him. Uh, that's a problem. I think that if, I understand that they had possession of drugs, but that person was ready to kill themselves. They were under the influence and they wanted treatment and they were taken to jail and that's not okay. So I think we need to get some type of initiative to where if someone's seeking treatment, especially if you're being called by a clinician at a hospital, um, and I'm giving you my clinical opinion that this person needs treatment, I think that there needs to be some type of bridge to where we can get them to us safely and not taken to jail. Thank you. Thank you, Summer. All right, our next person is Lee Megan. Shelton, and if I mispronounce anyone's name, it's unintentional. My name is Lee Megan Shelton. Um, I have lived in Bowling Green on and off uh, since I moved here with my mom in 1988 at the age of three. Uh, I'm a homeowner, a small business owner, and I'm a certified drug and alcohol therapist in this community. I'd like to speak to you today about public transportation. I am thrilled uh, with what I've heard tonight uh, about Hope House and that we're expanding and we're going to help some people. Uh, in August of 2022, I was determined to open my own business. And in the meantime, I quit my corporate job and I began substitute teaching for Warren County Public Schools and driving for Lyft. While driving for Lyft, I was made acutely aware of our need for better public transportation in the city. Uh, one example that stands out most in my mind is that of a single mother in scrubs, much like my own mother was for most of my childhood. Uh, I picked her up at a go bus stop at around 5, 5.30 p.m. And like most of my fares, I struck up a conversation with her and she said that she had ridden the bus as long as she could, as far as she could to get close enough to home, but that every afternoon she must then call for a ride share to get home to her children. We are the third largest city in Kentucky. This is unacceptable. Further conversations led me to learn that a portion of my tax dollars go to fund WKU transportation, a for-profit school. Though admittedly I need to do more research on this, I find this a gross misuse of taxpayer funds while citizens like the one I mentioned suffer. I'm curious to know how many tax dollars are given towards our public transportation in the city. And the, again, I am thrilled to hear what I heard tonight and that we are gonna expand through Hope House. I think that's great, um, but it won't help people like the little lady that I spoke to that day and others. Public transit creates connection. Communities that have better connection and more resources are proven to have a decrease in crime. Increasing public transit availability would mean more jobs, but also, as we've discussed here, access to jobs and potentially lower unemployment in Bowling Green. Uh, not only does this increase mean less pollution, um, but also less traffic on our city streets, and I think that's something that everyone can get behind. Bolstering public transit doesn't help big-time investors or community pillars like WKU. It helps average people living average lives. It helps the folks that I work with in recovery stay on track and get their lives and their dignity back. It helps our elderly get to appointments and it helps the youth get to after school activities and home games. It helps the people who voted for you. I learned in the military that we are only as strong as our weakest soldier. 
if we are truly Bowling Green strong, then let's please consider a move that will uplift the communities that need it most. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Shelton. <clears throat> All right. This concludes our business for tonight. Our next meeting will be February 21st, 2023. We're adjourned.